Welcome to all of you. For me, Mass or the Eucharist is always a really treasured time. And it's a limitless treasure since it's of God. We're fortunate today to have Bishop Bruce help us plumb even deeper the depths of this treasure. Welcome, Bishop Bruce. Thank you. Let's take a moment place ourselves in a conscious way in the presence of the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to enliven our hearts so we might encounter more deeply his love during this time together this morning. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for your love poured out upon us and your Son through the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts anew with that love that we might be transformed by this time together by what we celebrate most especially in the Eucharist it's the topic of this conversation open heart our hearts to receive the more that you desire for each one of us so that every Eucharist might be a life-changing encounter we make our prayer through Christ our Lord Amen in the, name of the Father Son Holy Spirit Amen what I want to talk about today it's really kind of come out of my experience in talking with confirmation kids you know, when I visit with, with a confirmation class before, before they're confirmed, I meet with them like for 45 minutes, okay? One, to find out what they know or what they don't know or what their readiness is, where their heart is in this, you know, wanting to receive the sacrament of confirmation. It's not just a quiz, you know, what are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, or it's, I mean, it's not, that's part of it, but... Um, I always move from that to ask them a question. And I ask every single confirmation class I've, met, I've ever met with since I've been here, I've asked them this question. How many of you are bored at Mass? About 85 to 90 percent raised their hand. So that tells me something. What does it tell me? It tells me they have no idea what's going on. That's what it tells me. It tells me that they perhaps either didn't listen or no one has taught them this. And then I present, begin, I, I begin to tell them or ask them, do you, do you, what, do you know the greatest kept Catholic secret we have. How many of you know the greatest kept Catholic secret? I'm going to tell it to you. And I don't want it to be a secret. Because you know those 50% of Catholics that have baptized Catholics that have left the church, if they knew this secret, we'd be building churches and not closing them. I'm not kidding. Here's the secret. And then I'll tell you how it works. Every sacramental moment Every time you participate in a sacrament, it's a, it's a personal, intimate encounter with Jesus himself in prayer or in faith. Every sacrament, every time you receive a sacrament, it's a personal, intimate encounter with Jesus in prayer. So let me ask you this, how do you approach Sunday Mass or Saturday evening Mass? Now think about this scenario. This is what it was like when I was a kid. Hurry up, kids, get in the car. We gotta go to church, right? We're late, right? That was how I was approached. The only thing is my father wanted to get there 20 minutes early so he could get a prime parking space and then we sat in the car until the last minute. <laughs> I would suspect that he wasn't coming to mass to experience a deep personal encounter with Jesus. When you try to gather your family to come to Mass, how many of you say, well, we got to go to Mass? Or do you say, how many of you say, you know, we're going to have, we're, we got to go to have this personal deep encounter with Jesus. That's why we're going to the church, to have this personal deep encounter with Jesus. When was the last time you said that to your kids? Or to your spouse even? Huh? So how do we approach Mass? 
Do we see them as the sacraments, as events, or not just Mass, but the sacramental life of the Church? Do we see them as events that we go to? Or do we see this as, as encounters of love and mercy? Oftentimes, we, we have diminished the sacramental life of the Church to be things we go to. I'm going to Mass. I'm going to a wedding. I'm going to a baptism. I'm going to a confirmation. I'm going to my nephew's confirmation. Right? That's what we say. Isn't that the language we use? Think about the language we use. We treat them as events that we go to. And when we treat them as events and we diminish them, I think like 99.9%. .9 because when it becomes an event, we act like it's an event when we get there. What happens when you go to an event? You can choose to participate or you don't have to participate. Right? I mean, I tell the kids, so what would happen if I went to a basketball game week after week after week? And I sit on the bleachers watching all of this like this. What do you think would eventually happen? I would quit going. That's what happens when we treat things as an event where we're not being stimulated or entertained enough to keep our interest. We don't participate because we don't have to participate. And in the end, if it's boring, then we stop going. So if kids are bored at Mass, what's going to eventually happen? They're going to stop going, right? That is what is happening in our church today. And why are they bored? They don't know why they're bored. I'll tell you why they're bored, because they have no clue what is, what is happening there. They did not come for an encounter. They did not come for an encounter. They came for some other reason. It could be various reasons. Well, my parents make me. Because the church tells me I have to, otherwise it's a mortal sin if I don't go to Mass. You know, whatever the reason might be. But they're not coming to seek this encounter with Jesus. They come, and it's not just kids. It's not just kids. It's adults, it's their parents, it's their grandparents, right? The Eucharist, the sacramental life of the church, is this mystery of encounter, right? This mystery of transformation, it's what it is. And I asked the kids, I said, you know, how many of you have a best friend? And they all raise their hand, right? I said, how'd you become best friends? Oh, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you how you became a best friend. You had, an, you had a first encounter with that person, right? And you were present to that person, mind and heart, right? Communication took place in some form. And something happened in your heart. Right? How do you know that? Because you wanted another encounter with them. You had another encounter. You were present to them, they were present to you, mind and heart. Communication took place. Something in the heart changed. So you wanted another encounter. Right? You were present, they were present, mind, heart, communication took place. Something happened in their heart. It's the mystery of transformation. That is how two people fall in love. That is how you two fell in love. Over time, a series of encounters, you were present to each other, mind and heart and spirit, communication took place in many forms. Your heart kept being transformed and changed, right? Until you got to the point where you were falling in love with the other person, right? The point where you wanted to give your life away to the other person, right? That is the mystery of encounter. That is the mystery of transformation. Hearts being transformed. And I tell the kids, I said, okay, now you're best friend. Now tell me, tell me if this is true. It probably is. is. 
But you talk like your best friend, you act like your best friend, you think like your best friend, you dress like your best friend. Right? And they go, right? To some degree. Because what happens is we take on the persona of the other to some degree. I would say to some degree, you two are alike. You've taken on her persona and she's taken on yours to some degree. We're not complete because we're all individual. God created us individually. Right? But we, the mystery of encounter, part of it is, is we take on the persona of the other person. And so I asked them this question. So you have been receiving, coming to Mass week after week, month after month, year after year, for how many years? Oh, bishops, it's about eight years. For this encounter? So how have you taken on the persona of Jesus? Or have you? And if we can't answer the question, perhaps we haven't. And if we say, if we can't answer the question and say, well, I don't know if I have then perhaps we haven't come to Mass seeking an encounter. We've come for other reasons. And if we don't come to seek an encounter, then we won't engage in encounter. The whole Mass from beginning to end, the beginning of the opening note to the, end of the last note of the closing song, are part of the encounter. It's all part of the encounter. Huh? An encounter that leads for transformation. I'm not the same person anymore. When you two started dating and you started falling in love with your spouse, I guarantee you, you were not the same anymore. Right? You were not the same anymore. It's the mystery of transformation. As if I'm coming to the sacramental life of the church seeking and desiring and engaging this encounter over time, just as you fell in love in a series of encounters over time, you will not be the same anymore. That's the mystery of encounter. Right? Transformation takes place. We fall in love. And then we will do anything for the other. Anything. Right? You'll do anything for your spouse. Right? So let's take this, parag this paradigm, this model, and move it into the sacramental life of the church. It's, all, it's the same. It's the same. An encounter with Jesus, although it's in faith and we don't see him, Although we do up here, if we have faith. But the encounter, the dynamics are the same. If we don't come for an encounter, we won't have an encounter. It's simple. Because we're not engaged in an encounter. And it's important to come prepared for an encounter. You know, I talked last talk about the secular world in which we live. It's filled with secularism, right? It's, and there's a lot of things wanting our attention, right? Lots of things. Lots of things. So when we come to the sacraments of the church, which usually celebrated in the church, right? We have to transition mind and heart in a very intentional way. If we want the deepest encounter we have to make a transition from the secular world to the sacred. So when we walk through those doors, we should be thinking about this. I'm leaving the world behind to enter into an encounter with the Lord. And so when we so if we come in at the last minute or we're walking in after Father starts working walking in, right? Do you think that person is prepared for an encounter? Do you think that person has made a transition from the secular to the sacred? No. 
And if we haven't made that transition in our hearts and minds from the secular to the sacred, our, 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 I believe anyway, our encounter will, de- will be diminished. No. Oh, Bishop, you don't know I have like seven kids I get ready for Mass. You don't know what it's like to get them in the car. And I understand all that. I understand all that. I mean, I get it. It's just, it's, it's individuals finding a way personally to leave the sacred or leave the secular and enter into the sacred in their own minds and hearts. We can all do that in different ways. But I think it's important that we do that. And I think the language that we use helps that. I'm not going to Mass. I'm going for an encounter. Language, words mean things. They speak things. They define things. They define what's in our hearts, right? I'm going to Mass. Well, I'm not going to Mass. I'm going for an encounter. That's defining what's in my heart when I say that. And my desire, right? It does. Words matter. So the language we use with our families, with our kids, matter. So if we want to help them leave the secular into the sacred, we have to use words that help facilitate that. Or at least bring it to light anyway. Does it make sense? So, I'm not going to get through this whole... I mean, I could spend three hours on this talk. I'm not kidding. Because what I want to do is start going through the Mass a little bit. About how this works. Okay? First of all, we have to come prepared for an encounter. We have to desire it. It's important to come early and not at the last minute if we can. So we can make this transition in our hearts. And plus it teaches our kids something. That Mass isn't just something we go to. But we need to come prepared. I mean, imagine if the Pope came. Right? Let's say the Pope came here. And we're given tickets to come for those because we have limited space. Do you think people would come early to get a good seat? Do you think so? I think so. Well, this is Jesus, not the Pope. Don't you think we could come early and get a good seat? We don't. People come early and they sit in the back. I'm not kidding. I've been to Paris and they come a half hour early and they're the last pew on the corner. It's like they're going to make a getaway. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. You know, I used to be that way though. So I can't criticize them too much. But then I saw the light. I experienced the light of the Holy Spirit. And I just started desiring this intimate relationship with Jesus and things change. When we desire it, things change. The Lord will give us whatever the desire of our hearts are if they're focused toward Him. Huh? So come early. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart. Holy Spirit, open my heart to this deep encounter. I just want to. I just have a desire to encounter your deep love and mercy. Because I know in the heart of heart, it's going to transform me. Huh? I'm going to become a new. This encounter is a mystery of transformation. Okay. And then we engage through whole, the encounter through wholehearted participation. You know, I'm, because the camera's there, I'm not going to go up there, but I had the best seat in the house. And not to judge people in their postures, but postures speak. I'm sorry, they do. When someone's sitting like this, that speaks, and I can see it. I'm not to criticize, but my heart aches for them when I see that kind of posture. My heart aches for them because no one's ever told them the best kept Catholic secret. They don't know why they're there. Or they know why they're there, but it's for the wrong reasons. We always know why we're there, but oftentimes it's for the wrong reasons. They don't know the right reasons to come. And that saddens my heart. I see people, they never pick up a hymnal. They don't sing. Oh, Bishop, I don't have a good voice. It's not about that. God gave you that voice, make him listen to it. Right? And everyone else around you. Because it's not about you. It's about him. Isn't what's the purpose of the song? 
is not to get the priest from the back to the front. That's not the purpose of it. And it bothers me when we stop the hymn when the priest gets here. Because that tells people, it speaks something, it communicates something. It communicates to the congregation that the hymn is to get the people from the back to the priest from the back to the front. That's what it communicates. Everything we do in the Mass, every single thing we do, every gesture, every word, every action, speaks something. That's the way the Church intends it. That's the way Jesus desires it. That's the way the Holy Spirit leads it. Every little thing that we do communicates something. And don't, in an encounter, don't we communicate, right? We communicate in an encounter. So everything we do at Mass communicates something. It's either our communication to God, or God's communication to us in this encounter. Everything. So the hymn is, communicates something. What it's meant to communicate is meant to Prime the pump. You know what that means, right? You know what it means to prime a pump? Like you squirt, get gas in there so it starts easier? Well, the hymn is kind of like that. It helps prime the pump of our hearts so it can help us to engage, to get our minds and hearts engaged in this act of worship, this act of glorifying God. It's not just a bunch of nice words on a page. If we think about these words we're singing, hopefully, they hit on our, the emotions of our hearts and our desires to offer this. These are the words coming out of my heart and mouth to the Lord. Individually and as a faith community. Right? If I think it's just a song I gotta sing and there's no, I don't really pay attention to the words, you know, am I really communicating what's in my, I mean, I'm communicating something, but is it really what I want to be communicating to God? You know, the whole Mass, the whole Mass from beginning to end is a prayer. It's not my prayer, it's your prayer, 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 your prayer. Our prayer of thanksgiving. The word Eucharist itself comes from a Greek word that means thanksgiving. The whole Mass is a prayer of thanksgiving to God the Father. Why? For what? Everything that He's given to us in through his son Jesus. So if we don't come to Mass with gratitude in our hearts, then we're not thinking about what God has done for us in his son Jesus. We're not. But the whole Mass is, is oriented toward that. Giving thanks for everything that we have. And in particular, everything that the Father has done for us in his son Jesus. It's a prayer to the Father. And if we look at the prayers, they're, they're all done in the third person, right? Plural. We. Our. Us. It's not my prayer. It's the body of Christ at prayer and worship and thanksgiving. We're all part of the body of Christ. Hmm? And so if we listen to the words. These are, it's not the priest's prayer. This is not the priest's communication. To the Lord, it's all of our communication in this encounter. It's just being lipped by the presider. Huh? But it's our prayer. Lord, we give you praise and thanksgiving. We, a we ask this through Christ our Lord. Huh? So if we're mindful of that, then we're going to pay a little more attention. Because this is my communication in this encounter to the Father. Huh? I'm going to have to fast forward this. And then the first part of the Mass is what? The penitential rite. What's that about? What's the penitential rite about? The kids can't even tell me what the penitential rite is. Unfortunately, they can't. We ask for forgiveness. Let us prepare ourselves, let us, let us acknowledge our sins so that we can prepare 
to celebrate these sacred mysteries so that we can prepare to engage more deeply into this encounter. Huh? And then what do we say? Well, oftentimes I hear, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Now, when it's done that way, am I really thinking about, <laughs> Lord, I'm a sinner, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. I am a weak sinner in your presence. Huh? May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Huh? It's thinking about what I'm saying in this encounter. You, in the encounter with your spouse, you think about what you're going to say, right? If we're here for an encounter, we are going to be thinking about what we're saying, what is coming out of our mouth. And then we get to the Gloria, right? Which many don't sing. Oh, isn't this a nice song? We sing it every Sunday. We can become creatures of habit. and When we become creatures of habit, it loses all meaning. When we become creatures of habit, what we do, it loses all meaning. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, Lord. We bless you. We glorify you. We adore you. Now, if I'm thinking about that, I adore you, Jesus. I adore you, Father. I praise you. I thank you. And that's coming from the interior of my heart. Don't you think that's going to be a little different experience than glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you. You see what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? This is our communication to the Lord. It's not just some nice song that's in the middle of Mass. It's our communication in this encounter. And the more we give our hearts and souls and minds into this encounter, the deeper we are drawn into it. Huh? It's true. And then what happens after that? Then we have the collect, right? Where we have this prayer, our prayer. I talked about that. And then what happens? Then we get to the great part. Right? Where the Lord gets to talk to us. Like, how does the Lord talk to us at Mass? Huh? His re his scriptures, the sacred scriptures, the living Word of God. Right? It's not just a bunch of words on a, on a page in a book. It's the living Word of God. So are we listening? Heart, mind, ears, are we listening to what the Lord is asking, is telling us, inviting us into? How many of you remember the Gospels from last Sunday? What did God tell you last Sunday? If we don't remember, and I can ask this, I mean, I can ask every, I mean, I can, every parish I could go in. So what did, and in fact, I was here last Sunday for Mass, or two Sundays ago, and I said, what, did, what was the Gospel about last Sunday? And no one could not tell me. I said, well, I'm going to remind you. I'll give you a little lesson on what he said, what Jesus said to us, the, the teaching that he gave us, because the teaching of today is connected. But if we're not listening, it's just like some nice words, it's part of Mass, you know, this is part of the Mass. But someone gets up there and reads the scripture, sometimes it's read well and sometimes it's, it's not read well at all. You know? I remember when I was discerning this vocation to the priesthood, I remember I went to Mass on a Saturday night, and I never went to Saturday night Mass, ever, ever. But I was felt being drawn there. Because I really had to decide am I going to go into the seminary and marry Linda? I, I couldn't figure, I couldn't quite. And so I went there early for this encounter. 
And I sat there before Mass and I said, Lord, you know, I'm in a dilemma. I don't know what you want me to do, but I just want to do your will. So by the time I leave Mass tonight, I want you to tell me what you want me to do with the rest of my life. That's exactly word for word my prayer. I mean, I can be very demanding and bold at times because we have to with the Lord sometimes. By the time I leave here tonight, I want you to tell me what you want me to do with the rest of my life. Okay? So what happened? I sat down for the readings, paying attention, thinking, if this is the word of God, maybe God will speak to me. Ask the Holy Spirit to allow me to hear what God's speaking to me through his word. I was like, whoa. I don't remember exactly what the reading was. At that moment, this was like 20, 30 years ago. But I guarantee you, it was as if God was speaking directly to me. And I thought, wow, isn't that coincidental? <laughs> so I sat up in my pew a little. The second reading, it was like the same thing. Because I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear. That was the desire of my heart. Same thing. I was like, wow. The gospel was the same thing, the same way. And then a priest comes out from the back. Evidently, he was given the homily all the weekends, at all the masses on the weekend. Because the homily, in some sense, it's not the living word of God, but it's the living word of God broken open for us, right? And the priest came out, and he started to talk about vocations, the shortage of priesthood, and all of that. And I, I heard, I mean, it was clear, very clear, that the Lord was speaking to me because the Lord does speak to us in this encounter if we want to hear what he has to say. And if we're attentive and we desire it, he will speak to us because it is the living word of God. Even though it may have been written 2,000 years ago, it is still living, living, breathing, alive today for us if we're open to it. Just like it was living, breathing, and alive to the apostles when Jesus was saying it to them directly. But are we open? Are we, do we want to hear him in this encounter? You know, do we want to hear him in this encounter? Okay. Um, conscious of the time here, where I want to go to. And then after that, we get into what? The creed. Right? The creed. Oh, isn't this a nice thing? This is what we believe. This is a teaching of the church, right? The creed. But is that all it is? Is it really? Is that all it is? I mean, if I'm, in, if I'm living in this encounter with the Lord, I'm saying, I believe in you, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. You know, I am revealing my heart to the Lord what I believe what I my deepest held beliefs it's not just some nice thing we do together it certainly is a community of faith and prayer it is and I don't want you to get this sense that this whole mass is just me and Jesus because it's not it's me and Jesus and the whole body of Christ right the whole body it's not a me and Jesus moment but we can have a personal intimate encounter in the midst of the whole body Right? We can. But the creed is important because it re when I share that, it's me sharing with the Lord, communicating with the Lord my deepest held beliefs about Him and what He has done for me in Jesus and what the power of the Holy Spirit can do for me that's been poured out upon me. Huh? It's not just, it's not just another part of the Mass. It's not just another part. Then we get into the collection. Um, Chris talked about the collection a little bit at the talk this morning. It was a beautiful thing. But that's the reality of it. It's not because the church wants your money or needs it. It has nothing to do with that. Nothing, absolutely nothing. At the heart of it is, I am so grateful and thankful for what Jesus has done for me. All that I have is, is because of his love. And out of the deep gratitude of my heart, I want to give back to him sacrificially like he's given his whole life for me. 
it's not about the church wanting your money it's about me wanting to come to the Lord with praise and thanksgiving in my heart come into this encounter and unite my offering my sacrifice with the sacrifice of Jesus on the altar which is why when Pam Summer brings up the basket everything communicates something right when the basket of gifts come up and they take it into the sacristy that communicates something it doesn't communicate that to the people that these are gifts that are offered with the sacrifice it doesn't communicate that or they put it off to the side because they're afraid someone's going to steal it who cares if they steal it it's God's money anyway right but everything we do communicates something it does that communicates something that communicates to me that my offering is really not, you know they don't think my it's an offering it's just money to the church and so it's we can put it into the sacristy so no one will take it instead of putting it near the altar the whole time where people move it in the sack because money counters they're not at that mass and they don't want to stay over later they want to count it now that's terrible what we give is part of our encounter and to deny us of that and have it united in, on this altar with the Lord is, is you know that's terrible it isn't because it's, it diminishes what, it, it's, what it's speaking what it's meant to speak it clearly diminishes it wipes it out actually when it's taken completely out of the sanctuary huh? then it's all about money and not about sacrifice my sacrifice your sacrifice how huh? makes sense I'm gonna fast forward now because we're running out of time but you kinda of get the I mean I could spend three more hours going through every part of the mass and talk about our communication the Lord's communication and so on and so forth but we're out of time and I want to leave some time for a couple questions if you have any but let's kinda of fast forward okay I want to fast forward to the most intimate part of this encounter which is what Huh? the most intimate part of this encounter is communion communion this part of this encounter is communion communion with whom Jesus Jesus himself Jesus himself gives himself to us fully completely body blood soul and divinity completely nothing held back he cannot give any more in this moment of communion he gives it all everything he can possibly give there is nothing left totality take the word I tell the kids take the word communion let's cut it in half what do we have com union the word com comes from a Latin word that means with so communion is this union with Jesus now think about for a moment <laughs> I mean, I, but I think we have to use this kind of this image this imagery but spousal love the intimate union between man and woman the spousal love where they give themselves completely in totality to the other right and spousal love isn't Jesus our spouse so Jesus gives himself completely to us right he can't give anything else nothing all we can do in our own humbleness humility sinfulness come before him and do what gestures mean something what does this mean it's a receptivity it's a posture of receptivity it's communicating something right what's it communicating in this encounter it communicate a couple it could, numerous things it depends on how you want it personally it communicate receptivity of the most precious gift there is right it could communicate a posture of begging Jesus I'm begging for you even in my unworthiness I'm begging for you huh? 
So that's when our mind and hearts connected with a gesture that is part of our communication in this encounter. We should never take the host because we don't have a right to it. We do not have a right to it. It's either placed on our tongue or we're in a posture of receptivity of a gift that we don't deserve. But yet is freely given fully and completely and fruitfully. Huh? Now imagine if we, everyone that came up to communion had this in their minds and hearts. <laughs> Instead of people receiving and walking out the front door. Now, when that happens, you have, do you really think they know what just happened? They have no idea. And that saddens me. You know, it's out of their own ignorance, and I'm not using that in a derogatory way. It's just they don't know. They've never heard the best kept Catholic secrets. They haven't. But it's so beautiful, and it's such a beautiful encounter, you know. And then we go back and we reflect upon just the depth of love that we've just been given, you know. And what happens when we, when you, what happens when you reflect on your spouse's love for you? Doesn't that deepen that love in your own heart? It should, right? What happens when we reflect upon Christ's deep love for us that's been poured out for us? That should deepen that love and that desire for Him in our hearts. Right? Remember I said in the beginning what happens, you know, encounter is a mystery of transformation. Through a series of encounters over time, we take on the persona of the other. You know? If we come to the Mass, to the Eucharist, with, a, with an intent, a ten, with, a, with a desire and an intention of encounter, over time, we become transformed and we will begin more deeply over time take on that persona, that sacrificial persona. We will. We'll say, Lord, I am yours. Do with me what you wish. Whatever, I, whatever you do, I thank you, and I praise you, and I glorify you. I'm yours. Total surrender. Huh? We surrender, and then we take it back. We surrender and take it back. But every time we come with, with an intent of an encounter, you know, the Lord continues to transform our hearts. The little transformation takes time, but it takes us through a series of encounters over time. You know, as we come to each Mass with each Eucharist with a desire for an encounter with the Lord Jesus. Because what happens after, we, when we have been transformed, then we will hear again, I don't know that we always hear these words, we don't take them to heart. Go in peace, now glorifying the Lord by your life. Go in peace now and proclaim the gospel. We will not do that, my friends, if we have not been transformed into this. So the Mass is this mystery of transformation that's coming from a deep, intimate encounter with the Lord. And we have to come to Mass with an expectation and a desire for that and let the Lord do the rest. It's not about having an ecstatic experience. You know, the Lord wants us to have it, fine, He'll give it to us. If not, well, do you have an ecstatic experience every time you're with your wife? No. When you were dating, did you have an ecstatic experience every time you were with your girlfriend? No. No. I asked the kids, do you have an ecstatic experience every time you're with your best friend? No. It doesn't, it's not about us. It's about opening our hearts to the Lord in this encounter. And let me put this in, another pers in one more perspective. I'm gonna, we're out of time here. It's about... So, if, so that, I'm going to move from the Mass. But just remind you that the closing song is not to get the priest from the back to the front or the front to the back. It's the continuation of, of our glorification and praise of God in this encounter. Thank you, Lord, for just what has happened here. You know, glory and praise to our God. What's the song? Glory and praise to our God. I don't remember the rest of the words, but you know, that's what it's for. So that we can go. Right? We can go. And we're going glorifying God. 
not looking at our watches. They can't wait to get out of here. You know? So let's... So if every sacrament is a personal encounter with Jesus, so the sacrament of penance, oh, what a beautiful sacrament. It's one of my favorites. If it's a personal encounter with Christ's love and mercy, which is what it is, like who wouldn't want that? Like who wouldn't want that regularly? Except what we do in the church communicates something else. What the church communicates, it's only necessary twice a year. So we offer it, you know, Lent and Advent. And people come, sometimes they don't. Or confession lines are short when we have them during the week or on the weekends or whatever. But if it's this personal encounter with the Lord's love and mercy for me, then why wouldn't I make this a regular part of my life with Jesus? Right? Imagine if you only said, I'm sorry to your spouse twice a year. Do you think he would be married today? This is a request and a rhetorical question. Right? You think you would have an intimate love relationship? You know, so if we're serious about our spiritual life, this encounter with Jesus and reconciliation is a very important and valuable part of that. You know? I asked the kids, like, who baptized you? Oh, Father, somebody, I don't remember his name. Who baptized you? Oh, Father, I don't recall who he was. I said, no, that's not right. If these are personal, intimate encounters with the Lord, Jesus baptized you. He used the priest as an instrument. Right? Jesus baptized you. Who's confirming you tonight? Jesus is pouring out his Holy Spirit upon you. It's not me. I don't have that power. It's Jesus. Right? It's Jesus who gives himself to us in communion. Right? It's Jesus who is the bond in this sacrament of matrimony. It's Jesus. Right? It's Jesus who ordained me a priest and a bishop. It wasn't Bishop Amos or it wasn't Archbishop Neinstead. I mean, he was the instrument. But it's Jesus. And so to come to the sacramental life of the church with a mindset of encounter, one, it frees us to receive the depth of Christ's love for us. It does. And I won't think confession is such a bad thing. I'll think this is a beautiful thing and Lord, I need this because I need you. And I won't be embarrassed by my sin in front of a priest. I don't really care what the priest thinks. I don't care at all what the priest thinks. I could con come and confess mortal sin every week. I don't care what the priest says or thinks. It's not about him. It's about my desire to be healed in the love and mercy of Jesus. That's what it's about in this encounter. And it happens in this encounter. You know, it's where it happens. Make sense? The best kept Catholic secret. I don't want it to be a secret. When it stops being a secret, we'll stop seeing people leave the church. And we'll see people coming back. Because they'll want something what we have. Huh? That's just that's simple. Not rocket science. But it's how we approach. And it's the language we use. Um, right? That's, what's, that's what it is. And so if we want to become alive in the Lord Jesus and we come for an encounter with an expectation of encounter, whatever that might look like, we don't judge it. It's just what it is. It's not about the experience. It's about what's in my heart. It's not about the experience. It's about what's in my heart and what's my desire. And let the Lord do the rest. And we'll, the Lord, you know, you won't see it week after week in the sense of some change, a big change in your life, this transformation. But if you go t through time and look back and think, oh, wow, I'm a different person today than I was. You know, I love Jesus more today than I did two years ago. You know, you'll see that. You'll notice that. You'll notice that because it's transformation. Okay. Any questions that you might have? We can use this five minutes for that.
Anyone? Does it make sense? You have to talk to your pastors about that. <laughs> I can't make them do anything. <laughs> I mean, this is recorded, so they can listen to this too. First of all, when people have a choir, I love choirs, but it's, it's the intent of the choir. Is the choir meant there to perform? If that's the case, then people won't sing. They should never be there to perform, they should be there to assist in, in the music for this liturgy. It's not a performance. But I also think, if, the, if our congregation comes to an understanding and a realization that this is an encounter that's calling forth participation in, from our side, you know, from, from, you know, from the people in the pew side, and this is part of our communication to the Lord in this encounter, then that changes, that changes a perception of, of, of a choir. It doesn't matter if they're helping to lead, but if, if the choir comes off as being performance, um, then people are going to sit back and just listen. They're not going to participate. But I think it goes back to one's understanding of what's the reason why I'm here today at this Mass. You know, I'm here for an encounter. And the music is part of that encounter because it primes the pump, it keeps us the, the juices of love and going in my own heart as I praise the Lord in this music. Um, but I, I think some education needs to take place regarding, regarding that, you know. Um, because everything, as I said, everything that happens in the Mass or whatever the sacrament is communicates something, every single thing, you know. When I come up and kiss the altar, that communicates something. It's not just a nice thing that's in the, that's in the rubrics. It communicates something. What does it communicate? It communicates because of my ordination, this deep and profound relationship that I have with Jesus. That's what it communicates. So I kiss this altar as my, as, as, as my bride, as, the, as my spouse. It represents my spouse. Will you kiss your spouse, right? I hope. <laughs> because, of this, because of this love relationship. But everything communicates something. Everything. Uh, the dialogue, uh, lift up your hearts and lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord and His grace and Why are we jumping up and down? Because <laughs> we're not charismatic, we're not alive in the Holy Spirit. What would, what would happen if people started doing that? People who are not alive in the Holy Spirit would start leaving. Because they don't understand it. They think you're weird. I'm not going to be a part of this weird parish. It's because it's a lack of understanding. I mean, that's why, you know, we've, with catechesis, we've done a poor job of catechesis, I think, regarding all of this. You know, we should be, you know. Because even in the dialogue, you know, the Lord, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Like, where's the, like, lift up, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Really? Did you just lift your heart to the Lord? Really? I don't see, that didn't, what I, that's not, that's not what I saw. You know, maybe your actions are different than what the, came out of your mouth, but, you know, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. And what is the, what's, the, what's the preface say? Yes, it is truly right and just, Father. You know, to praise and glorify. It is truly right and just, Father of mercy, or whatever the preface goes on to say. And then it goes on to say what the, what the Father has done for us in Jesus. I don't have a, there's not a, a Roman Missal either, but if you look at every, every preface, it's about, it's a prayer to the Father, 
about what Jesus has done for us, through, you know, what the Father has done for us through Jesus. Every single preface is, is about that and using different words to make that point known. So it's, so it's the Father speaking to us, this is what I've done for you in Christ. You know, not just something that the priest says. So we, we have to take everything that's communicated, that's voiced either by us or by the priest or by other liturgical ministers as either our communication or God's communication to us in this encounter. So we have to listen, you know. Father, we praise you. you know, we give you praise and thanksgiving. Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving, you know. But most people think it's the priest prayer. That's not the priest prayer. It's the body of the prayer of the body of Christ. It's just someone has to say it, right? And the priest has been ordained for this part. Hmm? <laughs> no, I understand. Come to VSI too. Because many of you have if you've taken my class in VSI, you've heard this on the sacraments. It's a repeat. Well, what's the role of the priest? The role of the priest is to lead the body of Christ in worship. Okay? So, posture means things. I know some guys do this. I think that's wrong because that's, that's not a posture of receptivity. What does this look like? Stay away from me. Right? So gestures speak volumes too. They speak something. Okay? But if we look at the Mass, it's, the Mass has come out of the Jewish faith. The whole Mass has come, has Jesus Christianized the Jewish celebration of the Passover. So if we look at the whole Mass, the Eucharist, it really stems from the Passover meal because it is the Passover meal. Right? But Jesus has Christianized it. Okay? The prayer position in the Jewish church, the posture of prayer, of entering into this encounter and this relationship with, with Yahweh, are hands in the, what we call the Oran's position, which is this. So that's kind of where it comes from. Because this is how the Jewish people pray. On their feet with their hands up. Because this is the posture of glory, of glorifying God. So that's sort of been kind of transferred into the life of the, of the, of the Christian church, the Catholic church anyway. But it's also a posture, I believe, of leading people in prayer. Right? And it's also that posture. <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't want to be... I mean, we have to put it. We have to keep it within a, within a, a proper context, you know. But sometimes people pray like this. This is um, what happens in the Latin Church. You know, this is you know for the Latin Mass. This is this is the Oran's position. Um, but this is a different rubric. You know, this is a different Mass they're celebrating. Okay, than what we celebrate here. And so I think gestures need to be. You know, in accord with what we're, you know, and if if you look, if you look at the rubrics, it'll say that's in red, like in the Roman Missal, in the Oran's position. It's not like this, you know. And some people I've, I've had mass priests have been like this, so this is like the goalpost, it's a goalpost position, you know. So I think priests need to be a conscious of their gestures and how they do or not lead people into this act of worship and praise. Because as the priest goes, to be honest, I believe, 
the community goes. Hmm? So it's just something for us to be mindful of, for us as priests, the way we preside. I mean, we all have our unique personality and what have you that we don't want to remove, but we also have to be conscious of, you know, my positions, my hands, whatever they might be, what's going to help people more, because they do communicate something. And what I, what I think they might be communicating and what they're actually communicating could be something different, you know. So it's important to kind of be mindful of that. But again, everything communicates something. Everything. You know, I could get into holding hands with our Father. I mean, that's a big issue. I could get into people coming up in the communion line for a blessing that should not happen. It's a communion line, not a blessing line. Um, but it's hard to change. Like these habits have, have worked their way into the church and have diminished the theological meaning of what we do. So this communion line, for example, who can receive communion in the church? Those who are in communion with the Roman Catholic Church and who are in the state of grace. That is, the, those are the people who are called to come up to this personal in encounter, this communion with Jesus. Because they are in communion with the church and they are in communion with the Lord because of the state of their soul. Okay? It's a communion line. It's not a blessing line. And so, but so many people, oh, just come up, come up, everyone's welcome. Well, that changes the theology of this communion line completely. It diminishes the theology of this communion line. But these are things that have, have kind of crept into the church for the last 40 years, or since the Second Vatican Council, 50 years. And so now it's kind of hard to, you know, it's kind of hard to stop some of these practices that have diminished the theology of what we're celebrating. So it's sad to say. It doesn't mean that we can't do it, but it's, it's us going out and talking to people and, and, and stop inviting non-Catholics to come up in a communion. They don't belong in the communion line. It's for Catholics in communion and in union with the church as, as, as a, because they're in the state of grace. So everyone's welcome, so it doesn't, now you can see how that diminishes the theology of this communion line and what it's meant to be. Because as I said, everything we do, every gesture, every action in the Mass speaks, communicates something. And if we diminish the what it communicates, then, then we become more Protestant. We're not. You know? You know, the whole reason why people were never invited up to communion, non-Catholics or whatever, and it wasn't a blessing line, is because people sit in the pews. It's not to embarrass them, but we live in a culture of inclusion now, and people feel embarrassed or excluded. It's not what this is about at all. You know? It was, it was the hope that people... That's why the kids wouldn't come up. Because they're not in communion, full communion. They haven't... Perhaps they haven't received communion, so they can't. So why would you come up in a communion line when you can't receive communion? Right? So they would stay in the pews. And the parents, with the hopes of parents teaching them, this is something they long to, because so they, they want to come up. But son, you can't come up, you can't go up right now, because, because, you know, you haven't got to that point in your faith journey. And so we've kind of lost all of that. You know, you know for better or for worse. But I just kind of put that, just kind of hold that up for us to think about, but that's the reality of it, you know, so, but how do you stop that? I don't know. Um, you talk about the purpose of it, you know, or your pastors talk about the theology of the Mass, the theology of this encounter um, during the Mass, that might be helpful, and, or they stop inviting people to come up in the communion line that aren't Catholic, oh, just come, well, that's not what it's for. You know, and um, so, any other questions? And plus, you know, on that same note, you know, even like Eucharistic ministers, lay people are giving blessings. <laughs> they have no power or authority to give a blessing. They've not been ordained. 
So they're not giving a blessing. I don't know what they're giving, but in the eyes of the church it is not a blessing. Only those who have been ordained can give a blessing. What, what the church would call a blessing. So I, I don't know I don't know what they're giving. But see, that's, that's, that's all of this has caused a lot of confusion, as you can see. A lot of confusion. You know? And how do you kind of kind of work through that? I, I don't know. It's a challenge. But, you know, yeah, the Lord is bigger than us. Right? <laughs> that's how I like it. The Lord is bigger than us. But these are just some, some issues that we see in the church. Um, in regarding this encounter at Mass and what what it's meant to be and, and you know and, and what it is, you know. So, but all right, I guess we're done.